large monolithic kernels that contains hundreds or thousands of third-party drivers. Every driver in the kernel has the same privileges as the rest, as, as the core kernel code, which means every single bug in one of those hundreds of drivers means that the attacker has full control of the kernel. And if the attacker has full control of the kernel, over the kernel, well, then everything is over. And, and, a, and a separation mechanism that was supposed to be provided by the kernel is useless because the kernel is compromised. And again, I chose a few examples from the last six months. Um, null pointer back in Linux kernel. That was July 2009. Um, a story of a simple and dangerous, dangerous OS X kernel bug. It was for a few years in Mac OS X. Uh, that was from uh, uh, August, not last year. Another bug in, in Linux kernel, this time from November 2009. And from January this year, Microsoft confirms 17-year-old Windows kernel bug. Well, kernel bugs are, they do not appear as often as Firefox or, or Safari or PDF or application bugs because, because mass operating systems, to, to attack mass operating systems, you don't even need to compromise the kernel. But still, those, those kernel bugs appear still very often. They, they prove that and this doesn't even contain uh, bugs in the drivers. They still contain that the kernels we have on Linux or Windows or Mac OS X, they, they don't really are, they are not really secure creations. And don't think, if you have a Mac, don't even think that you really have a microkernel. Microkernel is a marketing term. It's not a microkernel, it's a monolithic kernel. Everything runs in ring zero. The free PSD subsystem runs in, dumb zero, uh, in ring zero. So it's a monolithic kernel. So a multi-kernel cannot be made secure. It's just too much code there. And one of our flaws is just enough to, to compromise the whole kernel. So this is not good. So we need something better to implement isolation. Because we just agreed that security by correctness is not the way to go, so we are left with security by isolation. And just now, we hope you hopefully agree with me that security by isolation, as implemented by monolithic kernels, is again not a good, not a way to go. So we need something better, and this is where we came out with cubes. And the basic idea is nothing new. We're going to use virtualization to implement separation. We're going to move the separation enforcing code from a big, f fat, buggy kernel. Into a very thin hypervisor, bare metal hypervisor. That instead of having tens of millions lines of code executing in ring zero, we'll have only 100,000 lines of code executing in ring zero. That's quite of a difference, like a magnitude of 100 or even more. So we want to have a model like this. Again, that's very natural, that's not a no big deal. We want to have this very thin hypervisor running on bare metal. And then we want to have various you know, domains or partitions or security zones, whatever you call it. We want to have applications in those zones hosted in different virtual machines, or app VMs, as we call them in cubes. App VMs, application VMs. And then we want to have, we want to have the privilege, the only one privileged VM, to be used to log into the system and will be used to, to, manage, to manage the screen and keyboard and mouse. And then we want to have some service VMs that will be doing all the dirty work, for example, for the networking or for storage management. The point is we want those VMs, just like those, to be unprivileged. So for example, we have those networking, network domain, network VM, 
which contains all your Wi-Fi drivers, Wi-Fi stack, TCP IP stack, uh, DHCP client. And we want to ha put all this code here in the sun privilege VM. So if there is a bug in one of those components and the attacker exploits this bug, there is nothing that the attacker can gain by controlling this domain. And we're going to use Intel VTD for this, which allows to safely assign networking hardware to this domain so it cannot schedule malicious DMA to other parts of the system. So the point is, we don't want to have networking code at all in the privileged domain. So the privileged domain is a very, secu very thin, small thing that, again, is used only to manage the screen. All the applications run in their own VMs. I'm going to talk more about RVMs later. And I'll, this is all not a big deal. You could probably see some diagrams like this in some academic papers five years ago. It's nothing really new. What is new here is that we want uh, several things are new here. One new thing is how we want to virtualize GUI. I just said that there is no networking in DOM0. And I said that DOM0 is for managing the screen. So the applications are supposed to be displayed in DOM0. But how DOM0 is supposed to display them if it has no networking? We cannot use VNC or anything like that, which is the standard on, on other virtualization systems. So we want to create an illusion for the user to make this system easy to use, that all the applications behave like if they were executing locally, not in some virtual machines. So if this is a desktop screen, we want to display all the application windows on one screen. So the user thought that everything is like normal. However, because this really only will this be only a display of the content of this application. It will not be running in this in this domain zero. It will not be able to control the screen. So there is still a strong isolation enforced by between the VMs. Because obviously the problem, apart from monolithic kernels, another problem that that today operating systems like Linux, Windows, Mac have is that they do not provide and isolation on the GUI level. So if you have, if you have two applications, like let's say one browser and the other browser, even if you run them as different users from different user accounts, still because they are allowed to talk to the same X server or the same Windows screen, they are free to capture their own screen, send keystrokes to each other, inject keystrokes, sneak, sniff keystrokes. So there is no GUI isolation, which is not good. And we want GUI isolation for cubes, so that's why we just fetch the pix maps of the applications in VMs. So the actual applications that run here are called app viewers. They are they're like, they like VNC, but much more efficiently implemented. So the, sub, the contents of Firefox, the Firefox is running here, but the app viewer running here in DOM0 is only displaying the contents of the Firefox window. So obviously the Firefox application cannot really sniff the other application contents because it's not executing on this VM. Here's how this this um, looks in practice, because Cubes is already implemented in alpha stage. I'm going to show you some demo if we have some time at the end. That's a screenshot from Cubes. You see that you see a Firefox window running here. You see that it's running in, it says, it says random, random colon Mozilla Firefox. So this application is, has been started in the random VM, in the random virtual machine. But it has been brought, but this desktop here, it's, pain, it's, it's managed in DOM0. So you see this application looks like if it was executing on my DOM0, on my privileged partition. But in fact, it is not. It's just an illusion. Thanks to this, this Firefox doesn't have any control on this GUI here. Cannot 
take a snapshot of, for example, other application running here. You can see there is a, a red uh, padlock here and also a red frame. This is because every VM can have a label attached to it. And for example, for the red, uh, for the random VM, I have decided to assign a red frame or red label. So it helps me to distinguish that this is untrusted VM. It's just for news reading and Googling. Here you see I, I started another application, this time in work VM, and this is just an open office editor. So I can just now securely write some secret report for my work, work on some contract, whatever. And those two applications now are fully isolated. They execute in different VMs. They have different X servers. So, because each VM has its own little X server. But still, for the user, they look like if they were executing on just natively on one machine. I'm going to show you some live demo later. This, this GUI virtualization is very efficient. So, it's, it's, we, we could play YouTube movies here, full screen YouTube movies, and still uh, behave fine. Obviously, we implement things like copy and paste between different VMs, and we hope we do it in a secure, secure way. So let's say you're writing your secret report in your work VM, and then you browse and you want to paste something from, from the internet. You, you want to find some information for your work on using your untrusted browser. Say you want to paste a link to some interesting website, so you just select it, copy it, and then you press the magic combination, which is Shift-Control-C, which is always, always intercepted by cubes. And then it's a, it's a signal for cubes to copy the clipboard of this VM to the global cubes clipboard. You can see a notification, cubes clipboard fetched from VM random. Now press Control-Shift-V to copy this clipboard onto destination VM. So I can now switch to the destination VM, which in this case could be my work VM, and I want to paste this link here. So what I do is I, I focus on this window, I press Control shift v and now the clipboard has been pasted into this VM. And now I can press Control v in this VM and paste it normally. The point here is that if we had another VM here, some yet another VM, it would not be able to steal this clipboard because the VM is allowed access to the clipboard only if the user specifically set, uh, presses Control shift v when focused on this VM, which prevents any clipboard manipulation. And we also implement copying files between our VMs in a pretty secure way. Here we see an example of two VMs I have. One is work VM and the other VM I call Vault. A Vault is a special secure VM that is not connected to anything, to the internet, to nothing. And the purpose of Vault VM on my system, for example, is to keep some important documents that are no longer needed on a daily basis. For example, my old projects, old contracts, whatever. So say I want to copy this folder from Work VM to Vault VM. It's very simple. I just select it. I choose send to VM. I enter the name of the destination VM. It's important that I enter it and not select from the list because we don't necessarily want to inform any VM what are the names of the other VMs executing in the system. This is security precaution. And then we have a prompt from DAM0 whether we want to authorize tra uh, connect transfer of file system uh, files to this Vault VM, which, seem, which is very important because we don't want to allow VMs to arbitrary mount arbitrary file systems to arbitrary VMs because it would be a potential security attack vector because this VM might have prepared the file system in some malicious way in the hope to uh, exploit some weakness in this uh, VM's file system parser. So we, we need this uh, confirmation from the user and once the user confirms there is a special virtual pen drive appearing here, and we can just simply copy files from this just using drag and drop. 
So that's um, pretty simple and pretty secure at the same time. So these are the these were the very generic ideas about cubes and how working with cubes look looks to a user from the user perspective. And now I have some more technical details. If you don't have background in operating systems, Linux and security, you probably won't understand much from this part, but don't worry, it's, these are just details, all the important ones. So first, some, how do we implement Cube's GUI virtualization? This fancy thing that you see those applications like if they were executing natively. Can we get those slides, down, like this one, down? Uh -huh. So, the system zero, the, our privileged partition, which is the only one that manages screen and keyboard and audio card. Nothing more, no networking here. And these are the regular app VMs. One of this might be random VM, work VM, bank VM, whatever. As I said, every VM has its own little X server running. With a dummy graphics driver. So each application that is executing in a given VM, and of course there could be several applications executing in a given VM. For example, on my work VM, I have, I have my, my Thunderbird in email client, I have OpenOffice, Word kind of thing, open office spreadsheet, a um, couple of other things. We, by the way, we, we, we I ran those up VMs with 400 megabytes, which is, sounds like very little, but the point is, these are, the configuration here is, very, here is very lightweight. For example, there is no desktop environment running here. There is no KDE or GNOME running here. There's just a very little X server, nothing more. So 400 megabytes assigned for each VM is just enough to run Thunderbird, Firefox, OpenOffice, uh, and still I have 100 megabytes free. Which means if I have four gigabytes of memory on my laptop, I can run seven, eight app VMs at the same time with f full performance, so no swap. All the applications in one VM share this one little X server, but obviously applications in different app VMs have different X servers, which is how we implement GUI isolation. Now, because we want to make it very efficient, we want to be able to play movies in, in, in a Firefox, for example, running here. We use Zen shared memory to copy the, let's say, frame buffers, but these are not really frame buffers, these are compositing buffers, and have it on the next slide. We use it to copy the, to, we use Zen shared memory to make the, this video memory accessible to app viewers executing in DAM0. And then each app VM has its own app viewer application. An app viewer application is responsible for displaying the contents of the specific window. So, as, let's say this app viewer, this green here, will be, will be displaying, I have only two, should be three applications, whatever. It will be displaying the contents of this uh, Chrome or, or Thunderbird, whatever. Will be, because of Zen shared memory, it will know, well, the video buffer for this let's say video, or let's say frame buffer for this application is located, and it will tell this X server, hey, X server, here in this memory is the contents of this application window. Please display it. More specifically, we use um, compositing mode or composition mode in each app VM. Compositing is a very nice thing. It's something that all modern window managers are using today, starting from Windows Vista, Mac OS X, and latest 
KDE and GNOME in Linux, they all are compositing window managers, which means that the X server does not maintain a frame buffer only, but it maintains the little buffers for each application, which is called the compositing buffer or composition buffer, which is constantly up to date with the contents of this application. That's a this is, that's different from what we have in the past. For example, on Windows XP, you might remember that Windows XP had this uh, GUI experience that if one of your application crashed and you moved another window on top of this window and then you move it out, there were those white areas left because this application that crashed were not able to redraw the, the, the area that is now uncovered anymore. When we have a window manager that is not compositing, then the window manager always asks an application to redraw its contents. When we move a window over some other applications window and then we move it out, then the window manager sends uh, something like WM Paint event on Windows, which please, um, please redraw your, I don't know, right bottom corner, because it's just been uncovered. When we have compositing window manager, this is no longer true. In compositing window manager, the X server always, X server or window on Windows, whatever it's called, it always remember, it always has in its own memory the contents of each application, whether it's covered by other windows or not. This also allows for all the fancy effects. For example, the effect I have on Mac when I press uh, expose button and all the windows are presented on the screen is implemented thanks to the compositing because, um, because the window, the X server always know the PIX maps for all the applications in this moment of time. So it's very easy for it to create this effect. Or those uh, uh, 3D effects in Vista, right? This is again possible thanks to compositing. Or those other effects in CADE uh, or GNOME are possible thanks to compositing. So we use compositing too. We enable compositing on each of the VM, on each of the VM X server, which makes the X server in each of VM to maintain the compositing buffers, which, con which are PIX maps of the content of each window running there. And then we have, the, we have an agent um, in each of VM that basically talks to X server and asks the X server at which address in memory of this VM those compositing buffers for all the windows that currently are on the screen are located. And only the addresses of those windows, not the contents, just the addresses are being transferred um, to our app viewer that talks to the real X server that manages the graphics card and tells it uh, where it should copy from to display the contents on the screen and to create the actual frame buffer. To get some water. The nice thing about this implementation is that the amount of code that we have added to the privilege partition for handling of those protocols here. The, the protocol here between the agent and our app viewer contains things like, for example, when a, a new window appears here, our agent detects it and sends a message, new window appeared, its, frame, its compositing buffer is at a given address. Or when one of those windows get closed, there's a message window got destroyed. And there are like maybe six or seven messages like this. So this protocol is very simple. It's extremely simple. If you connect it to something like, compare it to something like VNC or X, or X protocol. X protocol is horrible. It's like it's that big. 
On the other hand, we, we expose a very, very small protocol. And the amount of code we have written here that talks to the VMs is just about two and a half thousand lines of C code, which is very small. If we had, if we had full X server exposed to those VMs, that would be like 100,000 lines of code. So this size versus this size. Just two and a half thousand lines of code, this is very small, which leaves very, very small potential for, for security bugs there, like overflows. One person can spend a few days and audit this whole code. This could be repeated by another person, another person, and we could have pretty secure code. We don't virtualize OpenGL for VMs. Only 2D, two dimension graphics is here. It's, it's, a, it's a conscious decision because if we wanted to provide GUI virtualization to VMs, that would introduce much, much more complexity in DOM0, which we don't want. However, DOM0 window manager is obviously free to use all the OpenGL and 3D accelerations. So all the fancy 3D, uh, all the fancy 3D uh, desktop effects are still possible here. Okay. Another topic is network VM. As I said, all the networking stacks and drivers and DCP stack and, and, and routing uh, software and DHCP client, everything that is facing the world is in a special network VM that is unprivileged. It's unprivileged, which means we don't fear, we don't worry about compromise of network domain. And obviously, each of VM has its virtual interface connected to a network VM that then connects to the world. We can assign, we can set that some VMs will not be using networking at all. That's what I'm doing, for example, for my Vault VM, which is used basically just as a secure storage. As I said, I have only some old contracts, old emails, my, 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 my passwords, uh, passwords there. So there is no point, it should have any connection to the internet, so it's just unconnected. So even if somebody somehow com compromised my Vault VM, they would not, would not be able to leak information out of it. You can, of course, chain net VMs, for example, to create VPN domain. You can have a VPN domain for just a few of your VMs, those that you use at work, for example, <coughs> but not for random VM. And here we can have the VPN password and all the data, and then use the network domain to go out to the world. Obviously, it's not a good idea to put VPN client in the network VM because we want network VM to remain unprivileged. And VPN credentials are something that is we want to protect it. So it's better to have another web VM. My network VM uses just 200 megabytes of memory. It's very small. It's, it, it, it uses less than 1% of CPU when I'm, using, when I'm downloading something. So it's very lightweight. <coughs> I said that it's expected that the user will be running many app VMs. As I said, I'm running, <coughs> I have about 10, 10 VMs defined on, on my laptop here that I'm, I'm using for my daily, daily tasks. Um, but probably a normal user will need five, maybe, or something like that. Each app VM is basically a more or less standard Linux. We use Fedora, Fedora 12 for this, which means that this, its image on disk would normally take some five gigabytes. This is not good because we don't want to copy the same image 10 times. That's why our app VMs use, they have shared file system with something that we call template VM. So we installed, we installed just one template VM, which takes this five gigabytes of disk storage 
which has uh, all the, the file, the root file system with all the programs and everything that you find in normal Fedora Linux distribution. And then when you create each of VM, it, it just shares, shares a root file system from template VM. So the actual storage that is needed for each of VM only depends on the size of the VM's private data. So you see that the file system of each of VM is divided in two parts. The private storage, which is basically the home directory, and the, the root file system. And the root file system is taken from the template root image. This is, it is shared in a read-only manner. So obviously none of the VMs can modify this template root image. If you tried to start Linux with a read-only root file system, it would probably won't start. Every Linux and a Linux distribution expects a read-write root file system. That's why we create an illusion for each VM that it has a read-write file system by using a code device, copy and write device. That is discardable. We don't need it. After each reboot, we reset it. However, those two combined create a read-write root file system for each VM that is based on the template VM, which has this nice property that whatever the app VM writes into this file system, because we obviously assume each VM can be compromised, which means we assume that the attacker might have compromised, let's say, this VM, and uh, the attacker got root access here, so, can, so the attacker can compromise anything here. So whatever they try to do with this file system, whatever they write here, they will think they succeeded until they reboot it because they, they have it backed by copy and write storage, but the modifications never go to the template, template root image, which means they are not seen by other VMs, which is crucial because otherwise I could modify some binaries here and have other VMs use them and this was just compromise other VMs in a simple way. Um, the home storages, the, the, the private storages, are backed by the private image file system for, for each VM. I've written here that it looks encrypted. It's currently not looks encrypted in this implementation because it's not necessary. It's, the looks encryption is only necessary for implementing storage domain, which I, which I have on the next slide. Yes, yeah, so all of VMs share the same root file system. Very nice implication of this is that if I want to update software in my VMs, I only need to shut them down, start the template VM, and update template VM once. When I shut down template VM, and then whatever new app VM I, I, I start again, the software is updated there. So it's a centralized update. If I have 10 VMs, I don't need to update Firefox in 10 VMs. I just update it in one VM. And each VM has its own private storage. So my work VM would have private storage, which would contain all the various projects and my email, etc. And my, my, my Vault VM would have some other stuff. I even have Cubes VM, which I use for Cubes development. So Cubes VM contains all the source code and binaries of Cubes, actually. Um, so Cubes now is being developed in a VM, in a Cubes VM. Finally, we have storage domain. And storage domain is the only one thing that is currently not implemented. It is scheduled for release two because it requires um, support from Intel TXT and a few more things. And right now, the laptops we have on the market, they do not support it very well. The idea of having a storage domain is that, just like with NetVM, we want to move all the disk drivers and disk backends and USB drivers and USB backends, we want to move them into an unprivileged VM. So we don't fear a compromise of some block backend, for example. The problem with doing this is <coughs> if 
we assign a disk controller to the storage domain, even though it might be unprivileged, it still has access to the disk. Okay, we can use encrypted file systems, so even if the storage domain has access to the disk, well, it still cannot really compromise the other VM's data. But there is, there is still one thing on the disk, on every laptop, that we cannot encrypt. Anybody knows what it is? What's the only one thing that I cannot encrypt on my disk? What? I'm oh, sorry? Yes, master boot record, obviously. Um, because when we boot the computer, it must be the master boot record that would at least ask me for the passphrase and start the decryption process of the rest of the system. So that's a problem, because if we assign this controller to the storage domain, but it has access to disk, it can modify the master boot record. Which is not good, because from now on, it can compromise all the file, sy all the, all the file system. So that's why we came up with this uh, architecture here. Mm. Can we turn off the slide here? Excuse me? Excuse me? Audio stuff? C Hello? Can we turn off the slide here? Uh, can we turn off the slide here? Can we turn it off? It's just not really visible. Oh, it's not possible. Okay. Do you have a slingshot or something? No? Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> when we boot the system, I, can you can you actually see this? Yeah. So this is the this is the sequence of the system boot that is supposed to make the storage domain truly unprivileged. So we start booting the system from um, loading a couple of images. I especially don't want to say what tboot is, but let's say loading the hypervisor image, loading the kernel, the DOM0 kernel image that brings DOM0, starting initramfs, etc. Before we actually load them, we use Intel TXT, and this is what tboot is for, to measure those components. And I don't really want to go into details how TXT works and TPM works, because I would need um, two hours for this. But let's assume you, you know how it works. So, or for those of you who are familiar with TXT and TPM, we make TXT measure those components and extend TPM PCR hashes, uh, PCR values with hashes of those components. Now, only if those images were correct, which means they have not been modified since previous boot, only then TPM will be nice enough to unseal a special secret. If any of those files that are unencrypted were modified, even one byte, then TPM will get incorrect measurements and will not release a secret that was sealed in when we installed the system. It's really interesting how it really is implemented, but I don't really have time for this. So assuming the hashes were correct, and the user also entered a correct password, or passphrase, or, or insert a smart card with correct secret, or use a token with correct one-time password, whatever. Assuming these are correct, they combined together, create a decryption password for these keys, for these encrypted files that contain keys, decryption keys for all the other VMs. So only if this was correct and the passphrase was correct, we get access to the keys. When we executed and loaded the, the VM Linux DOM0 kernel, this domain has been created. But right now, it couldn't, it couldn't do much. This is domain zero. Domain zero couldn't do much because it doesn't have control over the disk. Because I said that we are moving all the disk drivers into the storage domain. But you cannot start storage domain before you start the domain zero, because it's domain zero that is supposed to start an other domain in, on, on Zen. 
So we start this domain, but it's pretty much useless here. And now we have the initial D for domain zero to create a very small file system for storage domain. And init, init rd actually is executed by dom0. And we have init rd create storage domain with this very small file system that we have on a separate partition. And now the storage domain starts and can read the partition which contains images of all the other domains, including the image for domain 0. Now the storage domain starts exposing the block backend driver, uh, the block backend, so the backend for the disk device, which now domain zero can mount, decrypt because it looks encrypted, and continue its boot. So it can now boot, it starts X server, lets you log in, and now it can start all the other app VMs that again use this block backend to get access to very root and private file systems. We also have discussed lots of anti-evil made protection mechanisms. These are discussed in a in an architecture specification document that we published also with this project. Yeah, so these are the properties of storage domain. Storage domain is currently unimplemented. So Last week, we have published Alpha 1 version of this project. It's fully open source, GPL, GPL2 license. Um, we have website, cubesos.org. You can go to architecture, download the architecture document. We have wiki. In the wiki, we have roadmap, so you can see how was the progress, what we're planning to do. We obviously encourage contributors, so if you want to take part in Cube's project, just go to Wiki, look at the roadmap, look at the open tickets, look what we are trying to fix now or what we're trying to implement, send email to Cube's Devel mailing list and discuss it, <coughs> and we can agree that you will start working on something, we'll assign a ticket for you with some due date, and we'll be checking with you how you're going, and then when you write something, if it's good, we'll include it in the project. That's pretty much it. Thank you. And I have <laughs> I It's five minutes past twelve, but I started fifteen minutes past eleven, so I'm still gonna use my ten minutes. Uh, I'll try to do live demo of cubes here if I can connect it. Questions? Uh huh. What about network domain? Okay, yeah, I get your question. The question was, what about network VM? What if I, if somebody controls my network VM, can't they intercept my traffic or spoof something or spoof DNS queries? Of course they can, but you can do exactly the same if you sit here with Wi-Fi and if I'm using Wi-Fi here. There's no difference between you controlling my net VM versus you controlling this air here, right? It's exactly the same thing. Obviously, from my secure VMs, I'll be using SSL, HTTPS, SSH, right? And I would not care about you doing DNS spoofing or app spoofing and stuff like this. Okay, I seems like I have, do you see something? No, you don't. Um,
Let me do the mirroring mode. Okay, can we try to get the lighting down? No? So, that's a cube's desktop, right? That's what is being displayed and managed by DOM0. My DOM0 has access to graphics card and keyboard and mouse. So let me now start my Firefox in the random VM. So here we go. We have Firefox, and let me minimize it so you can see it's okay. One more thing: this laptop doesn't have um, okay. It has a NVIDIA card, and it uses experimental Nuvo drive, open source Nuvo driver for NVIDIA, which does not support uh, hardware acceleration on Zen. That's why you see it's not really smooth here. But if you if I had another card like Intel card on another machine, we have Intel card. You can use all the 3D effects here. And we're working on getting NVIDIA working with Zen too, so that should be no problem. So let me go to somewhere, um, see if it really works. So this browser is executing in a VM. But see, it looks like if it was executing natively, right? Notice the red frame about around all the elements. You see that we draw red frame even around the menu. That's important because, for example, we don't want to allow the VM to maximize for the full screen. Because if it, co if it could own the whole screen, it could fake all the decorations for other VMs, and it could display something that would look like my, my work green VM, would ask me for some password, and I would have no way of distinguishing from the real one. However, this is not possible because, um, see, this is, I always see the decoration and the frame. The, the, manage, the window manager in DOM0 always takes care about making this visible. So what are funny videos here? Um, this conference, well, invitation, whatever. Let's see how... This is pretty smooth, even though the virtualization... This is all running in a VM. Let me play some... I have actually, f I have a video with some more uh, f elements running. You can see that I can start the applications in each VM just from my central menu. It's because we really try to make this very simple for, for everybody to use. The assumption about cubes is that well, we still have f some more things to add, like graphical GUI manager, but the assumption is that it should be usable by any person that is not a Linux geek. So, I don't know, by a lawyer even, right? Anybody who is really concerned about, about their data. So, any, and anybody who is, well, not dumb, not dumb enough to, well, intelligent enough to be able to understand the, the notion of separation, right? Because keep in mind, just the fact that you install cubes doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you will um, doesn't mean that that you will automatically get more security. It's all about you how you define your security zones. It all depends on how your digital life looks like, right? For example, I have you might have only one work work VM. I have three or four. I have work VM where I use for email and, and writing contracts and where I have my PGP, PGP uh, keys. I have another one which I called work web that I use, for example, to update my blogger and log into my uh, hosting control panel, etc. And see, this is all virtual in a virtual machine. It's yeah, I can.
as you see, it, we don't allow to maxim to take the whole full screen. It's not a high definition movie, so it doesn't look that good, but performance is pretty okay, I think. Keep in mind, on DOM0 we don't have any hardware acceleration, so that should, that should be even better if we had one, because this wouldn't be running so much uh, CPU on this. You cannot, you cannot force it, because we because we manage the windows in DOM0, and if we see, if we see a message that, uh, one of the messages that come from VMs are the configura window configuration messages that contain the new dimensions for a window. So let's say a VM wants to maximize one of the windows. So it, it, se it, it sets new dimensions for a window. Our agents send a message about it, and we see, and when we see the dimensions are higher than our DOM0 screen, we don't allow it. We just clip it to, to have the title bar and the frame always visible. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, what? Ah, that's a good question. You add more software only to VMs. That's the assumption. Well, right now we are in development, so you will still be have to you will have to up, upgrade your DOM zero. But in the final version, there's, there should be no need for user to add software to DOM zero, and there is no network in, in DOM zero. Um, so you only if you want to add more software, you start your template VM. You proceed with normal software installation like on any other Linux distribution or Fedora distribution. You do, for example, you install something or you, or you download some RPM, you install it. You shut down template VM and then <coughs> in each new app VM you can start this software. It's available. Yes, we do. Why not? <coughs> but by just, by just installing a binary file on your file system, <coughs> you don't you don't let the software automatically run. You you would have to you would have normally you would have to click on the software or do something or let it install in services for example or s install as a daemon, right? Yeah, that's why I was talking about backdoors. I want to install this software. I install it on the template virtual machines and all my virtual machines relying on the template are compromised. Mm -hmm. So I have to have multiple of the templates. Oh, obviously you can have two templates and different set of VMs based on two different templates. The only price you pay for this is additional disk, five gigabytes of disk storage or something. Yes, but it's, it's a strong assumption. I mean, either I don't allow users to install software or I have to have multiple templates or I don't solve any issue with installing software. I mean, I'm only defending against a run by uh, browser based attacks mm -hmm. otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, oh, it's finished. Um, Okay, I'm not sure if I'm getting your uh, question. Can you rephrase it? Sure. Uh, basically, um, I can be attacked either by a run by browser-based attack, for instance, or I can be attacked by an email, or I can get some weird software that the user actually wants to install, which <coughs> contains a backdoor. So in this third case, either I have multiple <coughs> templates, or we don't solve the problem. No, you give me an example. L let's say I okay. want to install... Um, well, I, want to I don't know. Chrome, Chrome browser, right? I want to install Chrome browser. I just install it, and <coughs> oh, before I install it, I can I can look whether it it has some s scripts that will run, or I can just install it in RPM using no scripts option. So it just adds a binary file to my file system, yep. and now I just don't use this software on my highly security machine, for example, if I'm afraid the software is malicious. Yeah, but you're assuming that the software is actually good. So of you're course, assuming we, well, but it, that's always an assumption. If I if I use my if I use Thunderbird, for example, if I use Thunderbird in my work VM, <coughs> of course, if Thunderbird had backdoors, it could steal all my PGP keys. You always need to trust something, but I don't need to trust Tetris game, for example. I still can install Tetris game into my template. I will just not be running it in my work VM. I will just only run it in random VM. Yes, but once I give root access to the software to my template, then it, it can just modify any kind of file. And it can do anything. So either you trust the software or you don't trust the software. And basically, you don't trust the software. I don't get it. You, you trust uh, only, you can choose which software you trust for each VM. 
Yeah, but the assumption is that there are malicious software. So we yeah. do have malicious software. And I can't really know if the software is malicious or not. That's the, the basic assumption, otherwise there is no meaning in it. So you don't, run, you, do, you don't use the software in your privileged VMs? Yes, but you're assuming, assuming that the software which I am installing is not changing any of the, the files on the templates. Oh, I can easily, I can easily check that. If, uh, because we use RPM for this, it's very trivial. I can just see what files is being cutting, and I can also run, uh, install it with no script uh, switch, and I make sure that it cannot add anything new. That's very simple. So basically you're saying that you're defending against new software in the same way you would do in a basic Linux machine. So you're not adding anything from this perspective, am I right? Not really, because if you installed new software like this Tetris game on a normal Linux, you would, you would have to run it somewhere. You have only one machine for running. The same machine you have other applications. Now, this is once you run it, the software can do anything. On this system, you just can choose not to run it on my sensitive machines and run it on my only random machines. Okay, okay, okay. I get it. So the assumption is that you're installing only through RPM and through the no script in order uh, to trust um, the installation process. In this example, that would be uh, I can I can imagine uh, probably some other. That other installer packages offer the same option as, as this one, right? You can probably conv it would be probably a nice idea in the future to add something like uh, because using listing files and not script is for more advanced users. You probably want to get an idea of like install the software and don't let it modify anything, right? One simple s uh, switch, click. That's, that be. that's just a technicality, but yeah. Thank you. But actually, actually, on Linux, you pretty much only install things through RPM or UM or something like that. Right? You don't have installers like on Windows. Yeah, that, that, that's a strong assumption, so. Strong assumption? That's how Linux works, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. So, thank you very much.